Awesome. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Summer of Protocols guest talk series. This series is part of an 18 week program where a cohort of 34 researchers are exploring the various aspects of protocols. You can find out more at summerprotocols.com. Today, we're talking with Christina Dunbar Hester. Our next session will be next Tuesday with Jesse Walden. And you, there will be some pre reading material linked in the program calendar shortly, which you can see at proto summerofprotocols.com. So, with that, I will go ahead and let Venkat and introduce Christina for us. All right. Thanks, Josh. All right. So, really pleased to have uh, Christina um, able to join us. Uh, um, so she and I met uh, while we were both fellows at uh, the Bergruen Institute, and um, Christina is a faculty at um, USC working in science and technology studies, uh, uh, which um, some of you may know about. It's uh, one of the few interdisciplinary fields that actually manages to exist and do interdisciplinary stuff, like interdisciplinary stuff so often doesn't actually work. STS, I think, is one of the fields that kind of does actually work. And she's written three books, uh, Low Power to the People, Hacking Diversity, and uh, most recently, Oil Beach, which I'm just starting to read. And um, this talk she's going to do is, I think, uh, loosely based um, on the first book, but she'll also be touching on the material in the second and third books. Um, but yeah, the interesting thing about um, Christina is uh, uh, I usually find it very hard to talk to uh, non-engineers and non-technologists about technology because you're like talking across a chasm of like suspicion and I don't know, critical uh, animosity. And, and part of the reason I think I personally struggle is that when I talk to non-engineers, I often get the sense that they're unable to separate uh, critical opinions of like, you know, what I would call the sociology of technology and like, you know, uh, our VCs evil and our engineers like callous and negligent, blah, 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 all the people stuff from like uh, actual appreciation and uh, interest and curiosity about the technology itself. And the reason it was so fun to talk to Christina through the year and we were lunch buddies and we'd often go out and talk about stuff um, is that she's one of the rare uh, people I think on the social sciences side who manages to actually do that, which is like, you know, separate genuine interest in technology from like, uh, I don't know, pragmatic critical perspectives on the people who do technology, which I think is kind of the recipe for doing really good, uh, I don't know, investigative um, looks at technology and all three of her books uh, kind of do that. So yeah, looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Christina. So over to you. Thank you, uh, Bangkok, for that very generous introduction, and also for the invitation to speak today. Uh, and thank you, Josh, uh, for help with logistics. Uh, and thank you to everyone here for being present. Um, I'm going to put up some slides and let's see here. hope I'm going to put up some slides and sort of talk. I think there's a way to position myself kind of over them, overlay myself. Um, yeah. And I'm going to give a kind of, um, I'm actually going to talk about all three, three books some. Um, it's going to be pretty informal. It's also going to be very uh, image based. So if you're someone who, you know, needs or likes to have your screen off and just listen, that's fine. I'll try to narrate. But if you're someone who is not sure whether you're going to leave your picture or the, the video on, uh, there will be a, a good deal to look at. So that might be, I hope, sort of uh, interesting. Um, okay, yeah. So Venkat has already set me up very nicely. Uh, I'm a scholar in science and technology studies, which is an interdisciplinary uh, and methodologically um, usually drawn from history, uh, anthropology, and cultural studies, among others, uh, methodologies. But we also usually uh, try to, um, you know, embed ourselves in labs, read scientific papers, et cetera, not participate the same way, you know, science and technologists do, with some exceptions. Some people come to STS after training in uh, practitioner fields. Uh, but we do try to at least take that stuff seriously. Um, and I'm honored to hear that Pinkot thinks that that works sometimes. Um, 
Okay. So that's sort of who I am. I'm going to throw up a couple quotes and then just get into um, a lot of examples, which I hope will give us uh, stuff to think about and stuff to talk about. This is coming in around 35 to 40 minutes, so we should have ample time for Q&A afterwards. Um, okay. So the sort of guiding frames for my inquiry, uh, which again, include uh, archival and ethnographic and documentary research usually. Uh, one is a quote from historian of technology, Melvin Kranzberg, who says, technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Um, and that on the one hand is sort of super simplistic. Uh, on the other hand, I think pretty deep. Uh, so I'll just sort of have that up as an orienting uh, principle. On um, who I often sort of, foundationally I'm thinking with is philosopher of technology Langdon Winner. And so I've got a couple of his quotes up. Uh, first, the things that we call technologies are ways of building order in our world. Uh, and so basically this is a clue whenever we're encountering the category of technology, we can approach it as you know a material assemblage or, or system or artifact but it's also a way of, of building order. Uh, and specifically how Winner encourages us to think about that is through the politics of technology or how power and authority are embedded in artifacts and systems. And so again, when we encounter this, this category, it is always already uh, full of these attempts to, to build order and to you know, encode power and authority. Uh, whether or not they're complete, whether or not they're successful, you know, whatever the consequences are or are not. Uh, this is a sort of clue about what's going on in the category. Um, so in thinking about protocols, uh, I was like honored to be invited to talk here. And I was like, hmm, what's a protocol? What's the definition of a protocol? I'm sure you've all been talking about this already quite a bit. Um, but one of the things I came up with for an expansive de definition is protocols as terms of relating uh, most elementally. Um, and that might mean that there's an element that's materially fixed and commonly there is, but maybe there doesn't always have to be. Uh, and also something I thought was interesting was uh, maybe a dialectic between sort of opening up and you know creating terms for new associations on the one hand, uh, but control on the other hand and controlling the terms of associations. Uh, and so those are the kind of, again, sort of guiding um, pillars or, or, or whatnot for this talk. Uh, and so that's what I, how I decided to bring things forward to share. Uh, and so the first example is about radio or we might say protocols uh, for how people address one another and participate in society, especially uh, democratic society, small d, democrat. Uh, and so my first example um, is, as I said, about radio lurking in the background, and I'm not going to talk about history, and I'm not going to talk about uh, this set of protocols, but of course, the electromagnetic spectrum, um, you know, is a set of physical properties that people are exploiting in order to operate a number of devices that we take for granted in everyday life. Uh, and also, of course, others in more experimental or more invisibilized realms. And what I'm talking about today is the FM radio part of this. Uh, and specifically, I'm talking about activists who engage in uh, technical practice and also policy work. Um, and this artifact, maybe more than anything else, kind of distills what they were up to. Uh, this is, if people can or can't tell, it's a 40 watt transmitter uh, is the electronic bits you're looking at there. Um, and that is small range. Uh, it'll transmit on the FM band, but reach maybe several blocks, a neighborhood, no more. You can also see because it's being held in someone's hand, it's you know portable literally. Uh, and it's meant to be, you know, ubiquitous, again, small D democratic, many people can put their hands on it or, or use it or carry it around. Um, I don't know if you can tell what it's mounted inside of, but that's a metal lunchbox. Uh, like, you know, you might've brought your sandwiches to school uh, in a you know, Star Wars lunchbox or something. And then in the background, we've got somebody's t-shirt, uh, which is, um, 
I can't see all of it, but it's the Jolly Roger kind of pirate skull and crossbones. And the full thing is a, um, it says free radio Santa Cruz 96.3 FM. So there was an era between 1978 and 2000 where the only way to do this kind of small scale broadcasting uh, or to put a new station on the air was to do so illegally. Uh, and so there were quite a number of activists doing this as electronic civil disobedience uh, during that period. But they were also pushing for legal access to the airwaves. And so this abysmally uh, resolved slide in terms of pixels is a protest outside of the FCC, the US Federal Communications uh, Commission. So the you know, overseer of telecom policy in the US. And this is activists imploring the FCC to flip on free speech. That's what you're looking at, that sort of street puppetry. What you can't see is that they're actually broadcasting their protest inside the commission using one of those little portable transmitters. Uh, and so it's, you know, really bringing the issue to the commission, both, you know, the steps, but also the airwaves right outside. And this was actually successful. In 2000, uh, there was a policy change. And so that's enabled a couple thousand now new small scale radio stations to be built across the U.S., and this is from 2005. This is inside the commission and it's a meeting to talk about how the new uh, community radio station um, service, which is called Low Power FM, LPFM, is working for people. And so again, different, different tenor and tone from this event. Uh, and so the radio activists, in addition to uh, advocating for this policy change, had a really uh, sort of radically egalitarian democratic ideal about how to build these things. Uh, and so this is a new station building event in Massachusetts in 2006. Uh, and what you see here is a soldering station, but it's not tucked away in a corner. It's out in the middle of all of the activity and anybody who is attending the event is encouraged to learn to do it. Uh, and so what you're actually looking at here is a couple of local Buddhist monks who were invited to come bless the new radio station. And they were enrolled then into learning how to solder one of those boards. Um, and so again, the ideal here is to be very, very democratic, to teach people to put their hands on the technology, uh, to level expertise, you know, anyone can do it. And that's supposed to have implications for both thinking about technology and control of it, uh, and also for sort of ownership and voice in our media system. Um, and of course, in the background in this period is regulation. Uh, the new radio service, and these are again, non-commercial stations that reach only a few miles, they're very, very small scale, uh, are getting built in an environment where, especially after 1996, there's a um, big telecommunications bill that's Past that allows for incredible, incredible concentration in our media system. And with radio, there was actually over a 3,000% increase in only five years after the act uh, passed. And so these stations are an entirely, you know, sort of different scale and also, um, you know, just operate on very different principles. Uh, but this is the sort of majority of the media landscape is these big behemoths. Um, and this is the slide you were looking at as the title slide, uh, which I didn't explain, but I will now. This is in Urbana, Illinois. Uh, and again, radio activists are building a new radio station. Uh, this is on the roof of the building. They're putting up an antenna. I haven't mentioned the internet, but people might be wondering uh, why were people trying you know, so hard to, to have access to new FM radio stations around 2000? when, I don't know how old people here are, but if people were alive, uh, we're in maybe more of a tech clash quote now. Uh, but this was a moment of really, you know, unbridled enthusiasm, you know, sort of breathless urgency about, you know, the internet as this new democratic technology. And uh, so it might've been a bit of a curious choice to try to build radio stations and, and put them in the hands of citizens. The radio advocate activists were arguing that radio was special. 
uh, in that it was, you know, capable of being brought into sort of community scale, community controlled use. Uh, and also they didn't want to cede that part of the telecommunications landscape. They weren't uninterested in the internet. And in fact, to the extent that they could articulate uh, internet sort of uses and we might say protocols that were similar to what they'd identified as valuable in, in radio, they actually were very interested in it. So what's going on here, though again, you need me to narrate it, is they're also building, in addition to a radio station, a community Wi-Fi network. Uh, and this artifact uh, maybe illustrates that really well. This is what's called the cantenna. And it's literally something like a coffee can or a Pringles can that you might you know, have around the house as leftover you know, food waste uh, getting built into a Wi-Fi network. Uh, and so they were interested in extending this kind of hands-on community scale, community controlled and non-commercial set of ideals uh, to internet-based communications, but they just didn't want to sort of see the ground of that, uh, of radio, uh, just because everyone was being told to go, you know, hop on this new shiny thing, uh, which was internet-based communication. Uh, so that's that book. Something I haven't talked about yet is in this uh, vision of kind of radical emancipatory uh, practice where, you know, everyone's being taught to share skills. Um, the fact that they're, you know, in spite of this sort of lovely democratic ideal, certain patterns uh, that had crystallized around expertise uh, emerged that were maybe troublesome for the activists uh, as they were trying to promote this radically egalitarian vision. And this is a scene from one of these radio station building events. And these are two volunteers who've never done this before, learning how to tune the FM uh, antenna to the right frequency. And you may not even be able to tell from this slide, but they're uh, women. And so there's a gender politics here where the person standing outside the frame who's not actually in my picture is an engineer who happens to be a man who knows how to do this and is instructing them. So on the one hand, there's a sort of skill leveling, but on the other hand, uh, in terms of sort of trying to broaden out skill and make it evenly and, and sort of egalitarianly distributed, they're running into these sort of patterns of historical um, you know, control over expertise, which for electronics and related technologies, you know, often resides for complicated historical reasons with, with men, with elites, with uh, more educated people, with, with whites, et cetera. Um, and so that phenomenon, which was not something I had set out to center in the radio book, wound up being something I kind of sort of followed into uh, the next book, uh, which was uh, in floss and hacking communities, uh, trying to self-consciously confront patterns of exclusion and inclusion, particularly though not exclusively focusing on gender. Um, and so this is a kind of historical artifact over my head, which is a 2006 EU policy report um, about sort of economic prospects for FOSS uh, in the EU, where Researchers showed that the rate of participation by women, which people sort of anecdotally knew was not equal to that of men, was actually shockingly low, uh, coming in around 2% in 2004 when this research was conducted. Uh, and so that really galvanized a series of conversations that were already beginning to happen, but it really kind of snowballed into more. Uh, and so we see the formation of uh, groups that are still around now, uh, Linux Chicks, uh, Pi Ladies, Pi Star, Debian Women, et cetera, uh, really trying to sort of bring forward these issues of inclusion. Um, and this is a one that I really like, kind of uh, artifact from 2006, right after that report came out, people were kind of trying to sort of just bring attention to the issue, plant a flag, start conversations. And this is the Hackers on Planet Earth conference in New York. Um, and someone had made this um, silk screen uh, taking, people may remember this Ted Stevens quote about, that was a, about regulating 
the internet in net neutrality. And he had said something like the internet is a series of tubes. It's not a truck that you dump something on, et cetera. And so people were making fun of him for that, saying he didn't understand, you know, the internet that he was supposed to be regulating. These activists kind of took that quote and ran with it, uh, or we might say detourned it um, and slapped it on. You can see a kind of textbook um, of female reproductive anatomy. And they actually made t-shirts that they were handing out. And this is a way of kind of directly humorously, but very, you know, not subtly uh, confronting these dynamics. And someone said that they estimated the Pope audience to be about one to 40 women to men. And so this was a kind of uncomfortable uh, and funny way of having this, this conversation that some people thought they needed to have. Um, and so outcomes of this, uh, which some of you, depending on where you're active, may have uh, encountered, but not necessarily stopped too much to think about where they've come from, or maybe you have, or maybe you're involved in this advocacy yourself, include codes of conduct uh, that have, you know, at this point, I wouldn't say they're or they're, they're not without controversy, but they're certainly quite mainstream uh, in, you know, conferences and uh, project settings. Uh, and so those come out of, you know, these kinds of uh, advocacy work and conversations that were happening. Uh, and that's a kind of material outcome uh, where, you know, people were, you know, confronting their communities about these patterns and redesigning uh, their communities, trying to reflect values. And we might even say sort of hacking, hacking itself applying values of hacking to hacking communities. Um, and as I said, this is a maybe more material uh, sort of artifact you can look at, you could look up a uh, code of conduct. Uh, some other things that were happening that are maybe not gonna be visible unless you're a participant in them are speculative practices. Uh, and this is a list of principles for operating feminist servers. I won't read all of them because there's a lot of text, but I'll re read a few. Uh, feminist servers radically question the conditions for serving and service, experiments with changing client-server relations where she can, wants networks to be mutable and read-write accessible, avoids efficiency, ease of use, scale, ability, and immediacy because they can be traps. Um, and so, as I said, this is a list of principles for operating what's called a feminist server. And when I was first hearing about a feminist server uh, in an interview for, uh, with a European uh, artist and, you know, member of these hacking communities, I honestly literally didn't know whether she was talking about a real object or something speculative or something in between. The answer is something in between. There are... Uh, at least a handful of servers that are run by feminist techie groups that host content that is, they feel important vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the values that they want to uh, promote in networked computing. And sometimes it's content that uh, they're concerned about, you know, either coming down if it's hosted elsewhere or, uh, access to server logs, um, you know, being in the wrong hands, as we know, you know, what's happening even in the U.S. since, was it last summer, uh, with, you know, reproductive rights and reproductive freedoms being under assault. Uh, so this might be, you know, hosting information about abortion where uh, law enforcement can't check the server log to see who is there, that kind of thing. So it can be material. Uh, but certainly this is also speculative uh, and sort of bigger than, you know, just, uh, you know, a rack in a cabinet somewhere. Uh, the other thing I'll also point out is on the software and content side, they have maybe achieved this ideal a bit more. Um, the hardware side, you know, these feminist servers, in spite of all this uh, ideation, are, of course, still entirely dependent on uh, extraction and labor and, you know, post-use practices that are, you know, unequal and, and dirty and rely on inequalities. 
Um, and so again, the and and people operating them are aware of that. They they don't have uh, the the full autonomy that they want to. But I'll also point out, I didn't read this one. Uh, is autonomous in the sense that she decides for her own dependencies. The autonomy here is more interdependent and naming dependencies rather than a kind of fully, you know, bootstrappy sort of uh, autonomy that might be found in other strands of, of open source or hacking. Uh, and a final example here, uh, which I definitely wanted to share with this group, uh, is another speculative practice, which is crypto dancing. Um, and this is feminist hackers, again, in a kind of art space, hacky space in Montreal, taking the principles for the Diffie-Hellman public key and cryptography. So you can see that diagram here on the left and collectively improvising a dance to go through you know, the common colors and swapping the colors and you know, putting basically your body, bodies collectively uh, practicing in to this you know, principle of crypt cryptography uh, as a way of, you know, really thinking differently um, about the relationship between the mind and the body. Uh, and, you know, also sort of whether this is a collective undertaking or an individual one, uh, and just trying to sort of think through principles like what we saw on the list uh, for the feminist servers of, you know, of, of computing and of relationships that surround computing uh, and really, you know, emphasize, you know, social interchanges uh, in computing practice. Um, but this is not something that necessarily scales well. It may even just sound kind of weird for me telling you about it. Uh, you know, it, it's something that's meant to spur reflection, uh, not necessarily travel uh, beyond the space, or if another group of people were to do a similar improv, it would look different, right? It's pretty local. Um, and so in this book, one of the things that I was, again, for the purposes of this talk, trying to think about is I th some of the changes I think that the feminist hackers and others uh, have been able to bring forward are, are associational, but they're not necessarily fully protocological. Um, they're maybe harder to establish as protocols, they're cultural discipline, um, but a lot of the time they're probably stopping short of instantiating standards with the exception of the code of conduct, which is why I wanted to bring that up. It's trying to set up a protocol that governs behavior, uh, whereas the rest of these examples I've given um, are, as I, as I said, I think they're kind of culturally disciplining and um, and I don't mean disciplining in a, you know, scolding way, just, you know, changing the boundaries, uh, but they're not necessarily able, nor are they necessarily trying to, to set up protocols. Okay, so having talked substantially about kind of DIY tech communities, I'm now gonna take a pretty radical shift into the modern seaport, but nobody saw that coming unless you read the abstract. Um, this is a shift in terrain and scale, a uh, number of things. And we're going to start by looking at this slide. Oh, whoops, that was the Hacking Diversity book, if anyone's interested. We're going to start by looking at this slide, uh, which is a press photo of just-in-time shipping. And we can see here a kind of imaginary of frictionless multimodal freight. Uh, and we see the cargo ship and the cargo plane and the truck carrying the container uh, all just kind of seamlessly, you know, meeting each other uh, in this environment that's kind of there, but it's, it's backgrounded. We're really looking at the tech and the colors uh, and the kind of spectacle um, of this transport. Um, and you know, what I would say is, you know, as analysts here, we can take a look at this public relations slide and 
uh, examine it for how it's it's building order. And it's certainly trying to, again, foreground the kind of frictionlessness here uh, of, of these multimodal um, networks speaking to each other and, and facilitating flow. Um, and so this is a kind of, we don't know where this is on earth. It's a very you know, generic shot. The book that I wrote and places all of this in Southern California. Uh, and I think we could argue probably about how much my analysis does and doesn't travel beyond that site. Uh, but here's what I was writing about is this little spot in the coastline south of downtown LA, uh, which is called San Pedro Bay and which hosts now the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. This is the historical shot. Um, from the late 19th century uh, when you can see there's settlement, uh, European settlement, Euro European American settlement. Uh, and there's a little bit of a breakwater that's been built to reduce wave energy, but this is still all like estuarial coastline and hasn't been heavily manipulated. The ports were cited here to handle cargo in about 1910. Uh, and then they also grew to handle a lot of petroleum. And this is what the coastline looks like now. The breakwaters are much longer, uh, more modern, and you know, extending the entire length of the bay with notches so that ships can enter and exit. The whole coastline is you know, super infilled, super manipulated. This up here is the LA River going up to downtown LA, which is about here. Um, and this site is hugely important for US trade, something like 40% of the goods that American consumers uh, have in their homes that come from Asia enter, enter here. Um, and so this is another press shot from the port of LA of a modern ca cargo ship. As you can see, it's got all these pretty containers and you know is, is heavily laden bringing in, in goods from China. Um, and this is, you know, a kind of spectacle and um, it, almost a sort of technological sublime, I think, is, is on display with these two images. Um, but what that obscures a bit is uh, all the sort of work that goes into basically uh, having operational protocols here, um, including, you know, standards for the size of the ship, the height of the dock. The weight that the dock can support, the weight that the weight that the crane can hoist, certainly the containers themselves being, you know, standard mod modular. Also, all of these slides are obscuring labor, um, which I don't know if people are following, but the West Coast ports are having um, labor negotiations, and the dock workers have been kind of slowing down uh, imports, and it's a sort of tense situation. Uh, but all of that doesn't doesn't show in these pictures, obviously. Um, another thing that none of this is showing, unless we foreground it and look for it, is what historian Sarah Pritchard has called envirotechnical, um, the, the envirotechnical nature of this kind of infrastructure, uh, which is really obvious maybe in the Panama Canal, where the sea level of the Atlantic and the Pacific on opposite sides of the canal is not actually the same. Uh, so for ships uh, you know, traveling in one direction, they actually have to ascend to uh, a higher sea level on the other side of the canal. And so there's this whole system of you know, using rainfall um, that lands in the forest to come into the lake, to come into the locks, to float the ships. Uh, and Ashley Karst has a book about that. If anyone's interested, it's called Beyond the Big Ditch. Um, but while I'm not an expert on the pa Panama Canal, I just brought this up because it's really obvious to see it here. Um, but it's, it's true in all modern seaports. Uh, and this is returning back to Southern California. I don't know if this is true or not, but the Port of Long Beach claimed that this was the biggest dredge in the world in 1962. Uh, and this is about dredging the shipping channels that um, to allow big ships to enter the ports. And that's a continuous process, right? Uh, the modern seaport re relies on you know, standard depths of shipping channels and continuous maintenance to produce you know, the channels and, and the docks 
uh, for everything to sort of run smoothly. Um, and there's even a way to kind of jury rig uh, equipment uh, if it's not at the sort of final full standard. Uh, what you're looking at here, this is the port of San Diego and this is a banana ship. And for reasons I won't go into fully, the ship has brought its own crane so it can hoist containers on and off docks without the docks themselves having cranes that accommodate the ship. So it winds up uh, kind of slotting itself into this, again, sort of protocological uh, flow, um, but in a slightly different way. So there's a way to sort of overcome there not being um, docks, uh, excuse me, cranes on the docks uh, and sort of keep the tendency towards modularity uh, going. Another really important part of this is road building. Um, of course, the, these assemblages or internetworks uh, of shipping need other um, networks to connect with them. And you know, the ports absolutely rely on you know, cranes and docks, but they also rely on, on road building. And that itself you know, intensifies and accelerates uh, the, the movement of, of goods. And, uh, resources. So that's sort of also here. Um, and I don't know where we would draw the boundaries. I, I'm not sure I would stake a strong claim. Um, but the last point that I want to bring up for the purposes of, of this group in this conversation is uh, whether or not we need to consider, I mean, I think we do, uh, if protocols can be violent. Um, and the sort of examples I would give here, again, from, from my research uh, of protocols as violence or exclusion uh, include, you know, on the one hand, air pollution, uh, the trucks and also the ships themselves burn dirty fuel. And so communities that live dockside or along distribution networks are just routinely breathing really toxic air. Also, I mentioned these ports handle a lot of petroleum. So they're really undergirding um, the fossil fuel energy regime that we're living with, uh, which is you know, driving heating and extreme weather and all these things. Uh, and so that might be um, a way of thinking about, you know, and, and the effects of that are, are falling disproportionately on, on you know, different communities uh, domestically and, and globally. Uh, and so again, there might be a way that we'd want to think about uh, if a protocol works really well for some things, you know, does it do other, have other sort of knock-on effects, uh, some of which might be, might be violent. And here's another way of envisioning uh, that sort of violence, which is actually a lot of what my book is about, is about the sort of interplay between um, really ascendant volume of shipping uh, alongside conservation standards. And this is a fin whale that has, you know, met its maker uh, coming into the port of Long Beach dead on the bow of one of these huge cargo ships. Uh, so again, pretty literal violence, uh, kind of outside the frame of certainly the imaginary that we're seeing in those kinds of press photos. So anyway, that's book number three, uh, Oil Beach, and just came out. Um, but what I wanted to sort of leave us with here as kind of, I don't know, top level uh, claims I might make are with protocols, we want to pay attention to both material and literal, uh, but also sort of ideal, ideational, um, I didn't say ideological, one maybe could, but the sort of, you know, what are these meant to do? What are the forms of order that uh, people bearing these kinds of technologies or building protocols are trying to do? Uh, radio, for example, the community radio uh, that I gave you the example first is, I think, interesting in part because it succeeds as a symbolic uh, artifact and symbolic set of relations, as well as a material one. You know, there are 2,000 or more little radio stations across the country as a result of this work, but also community radio becomes a kind of tool to think with about electronic communication. Um, so those are, are both levels to sort of keep in mind. 
Um, I also want to put in your minds that speculative or quixotic uh, engagement with artifacts, with systems, with protocols can work to visibilize or denaturalize stabilized patterns. Uh, and so again, something like crypt crypto dancing might seem really idiosyncratic. It is, it might not travel well, um, but it can be useful to, again, visibilize or, or denaturalize uh, relations or patterns that we are living with. Uh, lastly, or not lastly, almost lastly, uh, the envirotechnical undergirding what resource commitments and or physical forms of maintenance and extraction need to happen or need to happen over and over to keep any given socio-technical protocol operating. Uh, and lastly, um, system level commitments are fixed locally, right? So any, any change uh, needs to happen locally, but also maybe at a whole bunch of different local sites. Um, and also, you know, there may be local changes that never make it to a system level. Uh, but, you know, basically, even if we're thinking big, we also need to be thinking small and thinking about how those, you know, do or don't connect or interrelate. And that is it for me. Thank you so much. Um, this is boilerplate NSF caveats and how to get a hold of me after today's meeting, but I'd be very happy to. Uh, have a conversation. So thanks again. All right. Thanks a lot, Christina. That was uh, great. Uh, and I think uh, uh, I'll kick off the Q&A with uh, one that in particular interests me. So remember when we were first talking about your projects uh, over lunch at some point, uh, I mentioned that the uh, only reference points I had for STS were, you know, things like um, Bruno Latour's actor network theory and Timothy Morton's hyper objects. And I think the common theme there is something like the naive way of thinking about technology versus social systems is as almost two separated but um, adjacent realms. And then you talk about technology as engineers, and then you go talk about um, social stuff in kind of like sociological frames. And I think the value of STS is kind of like showing the entanglement and thinking in terms of the entanglement. But when I when we were talking, I remember you were kind of skeptical of like the Latour or Morton approaches to that. So what would you recommend are the good mental models for thinking about this entanglement? Um, I, I actually, yeah, I, I would recommend people read whatever they want, actually. Um, I personally like to teach uh, Latour, you know, I'm, Morton is harder for me. It's not how I think. Um, I like to teach Latour. I don't like to work with Latour so much. Um, I can write down probably some uh, recommendations, but uh, it depends on what you're looking for. I'm I'm kind of a fan of the the entanglement in the assemblage can wind up kind of airy and hard to sort of latch onto. So I will usually be um, in a more somewhat, I think, try not to be like too, uh, you know, punching on anything, but like more grounded to me. Like I would recommend Winner, who's very, I think, precise. And that book that I cited, The Whale and the Reactor, is really uh, quite famous. Um, also work by uh, Judy Weitzman, which is spelled not how it sounds, um, is, has been foundational. Um, so like, actually, if anyone's interested, you might be, thank God, if you're still working on time, but uh, she has a new book. Why is my typing not working? I think that's what it's called. This is from like 2015. Uh, anyway, she's an exemplar of a person doing a kind of sociological uh, study of technology that's, as I said, very sort of, you know, grounded and looks at, you know, labor and material practices and stuff in a way that's, to me, a bit uh, less airy than uh, Latour can wind up being. Um, but, you know, I, I, anyone that's interested in like an STS canon, um, I can, I can try to come up with one. I also found a very influential, a very straightforward writing um, but Susan Douglas, 
Inventing American Broadcasting, I think is what it's called, is a, again, a sort of exemplar of, uh, it's about radio, early radio. Uh, so if that's not interesting, but it's, it's very well written and it's a kind of exemplar of um, just, you know, social so, studies uh, of technology analysis. Sorry, I'm babbling. What? I have a couple of comments in the Discord chat as well as the Zoom <laughs> chat expressing interest in the STS canon. So yeah, I think definitely several people in this group would be very interested if you could, uh, um, if you email me some core references people can get started with, I'll uh, share with the group. Uh, but yeah, with that, I'll open it up to questions uh, generally. So if you have questions, use the Zoom uh, raise your hand um, protocol. Let's see. Josh usually does this, but he had to run off for an emergency. So, try, okay, Dorian, you're up first. It's because I, I I have my finger on the trigger for that. Hi, Christina. Thank Hi, you for. Um, I I wrote this down very early on in your talk of the, the uh, sort of thought about um, McLuhan treating media and technology as effectively interchangeable concepts. Like, what is the distinction? distinction between media and technology is there a meaningful one like I, I i don't kind of fall on the same side as McLuhan, but maybe that's just me being canadian i would not want to start a war with a canadian over this um i think there are different ways you can answer this i think the way i personally would probably answer it is media technology is maybe a special case because people designate them as a special case, which is a very weaselly recursive way to answer that. Um, I, I think you can make an argument for a mediating capacity in other technologies too, uh, but because they have, you know, been broken out as significant, you know, even to the point of having, um, you know, fields of study. <laughs> around them. Uh, I think there's there's that way to answer that question. I think for me, it would just be like, there's a sociological or historical reason to look at them as maybe a special case. But I think that a lot of, um, I think it would probably start to break down if you were being extremely formal about that. I think people who do media theory or media archeology span might answer that differently, but that's my sort of STS bread and butter social studies of tech answer. And it's a fair question that's not resolved. So, yeah. All right, Angela, you're next. Great, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, one uh, one of the phrases that you used that uh, caught my attention was um, you were distinguishing between cultural discipline versus a protocol, and I wondered if you could say a bit more about uh, about that. Explain that a little bit. That's a great question. And I would love to be, um, yeah, I, I don't know how far I would push that necessarily, uh, but the distinction I was trying to make was, I didn't use the phrase like hard coded in this talk and I deliberately avoided doing so, but um, you know, in so far as many protocols come with a, you know, kind of physical instantiation um, or a standard, you know, that allows things to talk or not, you know, creates irreducible, um, you know, incommensurability, uh, that, there, that there are other ways of sort of shaping association or, or so shaping behavior um, that don't come with that kind of, you know, place where, you know, where the rubber meets the road, can these things talk to each other or not? Uh, and that that's kind of something that a protocol does. Um, and so that's all I was really trying to gesture towards is that I think some of this work uh, doesn't, you know, rise to the level of creating that place or I keep putting my hands together, you know, a sort of place where there's a handoff, right? Uh, where something like can proceed or can't proceed. Uh, and, and that is sometimes encoded in a protocol. Um, and so that was the distinction I was trying to make. But again, not all protocols have a, you know, quote, hard-coded or sort of artifactual component anyway. Um, I see the code of conduct, 
conduct as being kind of both. It's maybe culturally disciplining, but it's also uh, an attempt to instantiate, you know, a, a place where, again, a sort of term is, of association sort of works how it's supposed to or, or breaks down. Uh, and that that kind of, you know, place of uh, associations meeting is, you know, embodied there. Um, and so I think the code of conduct maybe straddles both, but it's at least trying to be protocological. Um, anyway, that's what I meant, but y'all have been thinking about protocols, you know, for several weeks. So if, if you have, um, you know, things to add there that I haven't thought of, I'd be very welcome to that. So thanks. Right. Oh, and I would also add, sorry, not all protocols are necessarily culturally disciplining. I mean, they are, but that's can be sometimes very invisibilized if they're sort of embedded within standards that look technical and um, basically like obscure or overwrite the, the cultural contestation. That's another sort of thing I would add. Anyway, good question. Thanks. Sorry, Bangkok, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, raise your hand if um, you... Have a question, or if you don't know the UI, just uh, speak up. But in the meantime, I do have another question of my own. So one of the interesting things, again, in my interaction with you that um, I got sensitized to is there's almost like a, an STV, STS way of like looking at technology. And uh, you and I have the game which you also play with a few other friends of like spotting gloves on the sidewalk or in random places, right? And it's kind of interesting. All kinds of gloves, um, uh, like uh, regular regular gloves, construction gloves, uh, surgical gloves, all those we've been uh, swapping those for a couple of years now. And it's kind of an interesting way to look at like technological built environment infrastructure, like where do like little bits and pieces fall off? Like what are, are what's around the edges? And it's a very different way of looking at the technological environment than a typical engineering way, to be honest, like a typical engineering way is oh, that's a cool machine. How does it work? Can I go read up about the theory of how the machine works or that machine is broken or <clears throat> is poorly designed and can I make it better or can I invent a different machine, right? That's the engineering way of looking at the technological environment. Whereas uh, your Twitter feed is kind of like, um, like the extended version of the glove exchange we have. You have like pictures of birds and wildlife and other random views of uh, the environment that, uh, I don't know, it's, it takes a particular eye. So can you speak a little bit to like, what's the STS eye on the environment and how you develop it and sensitize yourself to that way of seeing? Yeah. Um, I can. The I think STS, or at least STS as I participate in it, uh, is always attention or attentive to basically standpoint um, and sort of questioning universality or, or claims to universalism. Uh, and so what I mean by that is, you know, your feet are always planted on the ground somewhere. You're always, maybe this gets us a little bit to Dorian's uh, area of query also, like, you know, you're always mediating the environment through, uh, you know, a body and a history and, you know, a history that precedes you. Um, and so Donna Haraway, who's another person who certainly belongs on the canon here, uh, argues against what she calls the, the God trick, uh, which is, uh, she would say, pretending to see everything from nowhere. Uh, and so we're always the kind of SCS I'm always doing. And, and I think that's pretty um, integral to the field is kind of inverting that, right? Always trying to look for the particular or being, in my case, sort of unable to not see the particular and then trying to look at the sort of bigger level systems that have maybe brought that into being, but always sort of going through, um, you know, smaller, often uh, objects. And another way of thinking of this that I often wind up talking about with students is like, I'm wearing clothes, many layers because it's sort of cold here, but like thinking about the seams, right? Uh, showing the seams and sort of opening things up from the process where things that uh, didn't fit together are made to fit together, right? Those, those seams are places to see controversies, exclusions, 
uh, successful assemblages, of course, uh, but you know, those things getting built. Uh, and so that's the sort of perspective I usually have on things. Um, there's a piece that I will include for you that's called Writing the Implosion uh, by Joe Dumit. Uh, that is, I would call, I don't know if it's canon, but it's, he's a student of Haraway and sort of talking about like how to think the way she thinks. And it, you know, it, it takes a small object and then winds up sort of blowing it out to look at, you know, big systems, big processes, big histories, big um, knowledge systems that sort of go into making it. Uh, and so that's something, you know, I'm at this point attuned to and, and practice, uh, which is also part of why the port was a kind of different scale of project for me, because it's a very, very, very big object. And I was sort of like, how do I write about it without doing uh, a kind of Morton style analysis? Um, and I wound up having to sort of figure out how, or attempt to figure out how to break it down into, you know, very local, very parcel uh, things that I could approach, even if I'm telling, you know, a story that connects up to become very big. But yeah. I think it was you who pointed out to me, like, while the pandemic um, log jam was going on and the port was overflowing, they were parking containers in like residential neighborhoods in uh, a long beach and people were protesting that they were running out of parking, right? So I think that's about as small scale as uh, container shipping gets. But uh, yeah, we have a couple more minutes. Anybody have any last questions? All right, then uh, thank you, Christina. Oh, wait, Dorian has one more question, I think. Oh, go ahead, Dorian. Moving it on me. Um, I was gonna ask about the instincts of the radio uh, people about not giving up their piece of the spectrum. Um, if you can sort of elucidate on that one, that was interesting to me. Um, yeah, so the radio people, I think there were a couple things going on. One is um, some of them were very resolutely committed to, and we might even say again, sort of culturally disciplined by a commitment to appropriate technology and sort of came out of thinking about, you know, um, it's a movement from approximately the 1970s, but it also has sort of earlier roots in uh, kind of American small scale producerism. You know, the quote, small is beautiful being one of the or techs uh, you know, what are community scale uh, technologies, you know, water, solar, um, you know, barn raising, that was what they actually called their radio station building events. So sort of getting your neighbors together to frame up a barn and do something, you know, that scaled to the community, but not bigger. Uh, and so I think there was some of that in it. Um, but another was, you know, if the spectrum is so worthless, why are the corporations not giving it up, right? And so, and, and you know, it's actually, if we're, you know, empirically rigorous, right-wing radio, for example, is a huge part of the right-wing media uh, ecosystem. It's not just, you know, QAnon on the internet or something, although that's also, I don't want to get into too much of this, but like, not giving up radio is is something that you know culturally and economically is you know a valid point to be sort of pushing back on. So I think that those are two of the answers. Uh, one that it sort of fit within um, a again a sort of vision of of small and community scale technology, and that that was something that they wanted to like retain a, a bit of a claim to. Uh, but another was you know the death of radio has been proclaimed many, many times since the advent of television. And, you know, it's changed some, but it's actually super important. People listen to it in, in their cars and people who, for whatever sets of reasons, um, you know, don't value or, or don't use uh, certain other kinds of, you know, media products. Like it, it's an important part of the ecosystem. And so their attitude was always like, if, if the corporations are giving up the spectrum, uh, that might be an indication that it's no longer culturally or economically valuable, but they're not. So we're staying in there. And I think that their critiques were, you know, right. And, and in a way, you know, with what we're seeing with social media sort of fracturing and, and falling apart right now, uh, having 
you know, non-commercial community scale and maybe decentralized sort of claims to pieces of this larger assemblage, you know, I, th I think that their critiques were really present mm -hmm. in a way, even though I think they were not, they were not anticipating what happened uh, materially with these sort of platform intermediaries, uh, you know, anyway, I'm, I'm getting beyond your question, but that's the answer. It occurred to me just just uh, thinking about it though that like number one like I, mean, I guess to what extent does uh, right wing talk radio uh, owe its existence to like early fascist radio broadcasting, but also um, the radio technology itself is a uh, uh, almost kind of like a, a, a crisis uh, a, a medium to the extent that um, it's really simple like a ten year old can build a radio kind of thing. And in these sort of cases where, you know, the internet breaks and we can't fix it, like, you know, it's like, I'm thinking like Station Eleven kind of style, uh, you know, post-apocalyptic scenarios as well. And I don't know how that, much of that factors in, but neither. But, yeah, so they would also, actually, this is important, especially in lobbying Congress, they would make the point that radio is also a really robust and resilient uh, network in times of disasters. And actually the transmitter in the lunchbox that I showed you one of the things that that had been used for was communication during Katrina uh, and radio stations, you know, were really important in uh, helping community members, you know, talk to one another and have the lay of the land uh, in that environment. So that's another way that, you know, having radio as a kind of resilient, robust backstop uh, is, is important. Uh, and so that's in there too, that it is just kind of different. Um, I would say also though that the distinction being made here is one of scale and that these little tiny community stations, they're not networked, right? Uh, and so at networking, you get into big capital commitments and you get into, again, the sort of reach that could be used for progressive democratic ends or could be used for regressive you know, ones. And there is is a real difference in kind, I think, between these little non-scaled decentralized stations and um, networked broadcasting being used for whatever purpose. Like, even if it's regressive, it can only go so far. So, yeah, yeah. On that hopeful note. <laughs> All right, thank you again, um, Christina. We are at the hour. There is an active conversation going on at the Discord, so we can continue chatting there. And looking forward to those links from you, Christina, to share with the group. And we'll be back next week with uh, Jesse Walden on Tuesday, I believe. So, okay, thanks. great. Thank you again. Yeah, I'll I'll be in touch with with some reading recommendations. And thanks for the conversation and the invitation. See you all later. Thanks, Christina.